It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the film festival, to the Winter Garden, one of the best theaters in the city, in the world. And to this screening, the premiere of Zacharias Canuck's One Day in the Life of Noah Piatuk. To begin, we'd like to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are very grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. I want to remind you guys... <laughs> this film is eligible for the Gross People's Choice Award. Vote for your favorite films at tiff.net slash vote. And we'd like to thank Asuma Distribution International Limited for providing us with the movie to, uh, this afternoon. Uh, they're great partners and have been for many years, so we're thrilled, always thrilled to work with them. Um, the, it's an honor to be up here to introduce this filmmaker. Um, uh, you may have seen Anton Arjuad or The Fast Runner a couple years ago, which uh, won, I believe, the camera door at the Cannes Film Festival. Uh, Journals of Nude Rasmussen, which opened TIFF a number of years ago. The Searchers, which played our platform program, I think three or four years ago. Um, and this one, which I think ranks with his finest. Uh, it is a, it takes place at a key historical moment and views it through the, uh, the, the lives of the people, in, uh, the particular people involved. It is, uh, it is, it's, I think, one of the most important films of the year. It's also kind of slyly funny, the, the interchange, uh, the, what people think, what, the, 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 the gap between what, what people think they're saying is, is, uh, is often rather comical, but also has obviously very serious historical undertones. There's some great performances in it. It's beautifully shot, and it's directed by one of the greatest filmmakers in the world. Please join me in welcoming Zacharias Canuck. Welcome. Welcome to the show. I, got, I don't have any much to say, but because this, this film speaks for itself, and this story happens in 1961, and we'll be around after the show. Enjoy the show. Co-writer, editor, and co-cinematographer Norman Cohn. <laughs> Producer and co-cinematographer Jonathan France. Lucy Tulagarjic, first AD. Noah himself, Apayata Kotiak. And Zacharias Canuck. Questions? Comments? Anyone? Just throw your hand up. You can, anyone want to see? Yeah, right there. Uh, 
Uh, the gentleman loved the film. Why did you choose? Uh, it's Kim Bodney, actually. He's a Danish actor uh, from uh, from The Pusher and the, the trilogy there. Why did you cast Kim Bodney in, in the main role or the main the, the sec secondary role? Hey, Kim, um, he acted with us before in the journals of Conor Rasmussen, and he's a very good actor. He's from uh, Denmark. And yeah, we used him again because he's like a friend of ours. Right there. Can you talk about how the, the translator chose to translate some things and not others, particularly the orders, right? Just the orders, all right, yeah. Can you talk a bit about that? Uh, what, uh, is there a specific question or just? Well, that's part of the story. <laughs> all the misunderstanding that uh, it goes through in this film, but that is the story. The gentleman is fluent in English, and so is Apayata. But they acted so well, you, you believe that they don't speak properly. Next? Anybody up, up top? Oh, right there. Uh, were there other bilingual jokes we might not have got? Uh, particularly about, you mentioned the grandmother. Uh, the grandmother, yeah. uh, I knew that how to find the English word in Danish, because grandmother, because of the English, right? But were there other jokes that I didn't get for bilingual and other subjects, other than the translator's uh, talking around the English? Yeah, it's uh, naming that it's, it's in our culture that we use, like if my father died and my daughter had a baby girl, we would still call her the father. So it's, it's the naming that we wanted to continue. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just... Respecting the, the ancestors that uh, the name carries. Okay. We could watch the film again, maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's uh, next. Anybody up there? Uh, the, the question was, did Noah eventually move into the settlement, and if he did, when? Did Noah actually move into the, the settlement that they were proposing he move into? Well, I can't really say, because I'm a young. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when I was a child, Pirati was an old man and never know where he was a cut from. But I was living in the far away from him called Agu Bay. He was living in the Kapuri Langwe. First time I see him, I was scared because I was young. I don't know where he was a cut from. But my parents and others tell me he's my relative. So far, it's my cousin. And I know a lot about story about him and what the action comes. Sa Kunuk sues me, I believe. So acted out it, but I feel confident about it because it's a part of my life anyway. Thank you for listening. I don't know when he actually moved. 
nobody really knows. But it's in the 60s, I mean, after that, I came to Eagle League in 1966. Um, I think he was already there. Where did you guys find that, that, that footage is when, he, when he's singing at the end? Where did that come from? That's a, was it a research project or a, no, with Noah singing at the end? Um, in 1992, we got a small um, cultural grant to record uh, traditional songs. Um, Zach assembled about uh, 12 or 15 elders, all of whom are passed away now, and spent they spent a week uh, trying to discuss the history of all of these songs, some of them going back hundreds of years. They picked 25 and then they recorded them and we brought a recording engineer up from Montreal named Hani Habashi and uh, went into the Iglulik Research Center and set up a sound studio. And Piugatuk was um, was part of that group. He was the oldest member of the group and uh, sang uh, some unforgettable songs. So we were, if we filmed it all while we were recording. We released a CD in, I think, 1993 of these uh, 24 songs that tell these different stories by these elders. And uh, just recently, we edited the video footage from that session, which is on our website now. It's called Kingili Part One. And um, so it was Zach and I uh, making a recording. And uh, this footage uh, lasted until it found its correct place. It's a beautiful way to end the film, I think. Right there. Has the film been shown in Aglulik, and what was the reaction from the community? Yeah, so. We did show it, um, but we showed it through our community channel. In Iglulik, we have our Inuktitut community channel, and we played it through there. Uh, so, remarks, we, we didn't get remarks. I mean, if it was bad, we would get remarks. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, right in the middle there, yeah. The, the lady liked the, uh, the, the journeys on the sleds and she wondered why people were sort of um, uh, getting on and getting off, uh, uh, you know, relatively frequently. Um, what, what's the, why was that? Yeah, sometimes uh, kids, you see them playing tag while they're running and sometimes somebody falls and gets left behind. Uh, kids are playing, sometimes it's, to get the weight off the sled so they go faster. And sometimes you see at the end, it looks really cold. People are running to warm up, uh, warming up. Okay, um, next. Yeah, at the, in, under the balcony there, and then we'll get the waiver, go. Yeah, doing the glasses with the white sweater, yep. Uh, the uh, lady really enjoyed the film. She wanted to know how you got the story, how you developed the story that particular day or how you heard details about it. Or is it entirely fictional yeah. or was um, it? We had our partner, Norman and I, we had Paul Apak and Paul Hoytrick, two of our partners who are gone now. Um, 
Paul used to tell us that story because he was in this meeting. And since our culture is oral, nothing is written down, we decided hey, this is this is good. This is a good this could be a good film. And we did it. And we went to uh, we talked to elders and we were lucky to get one person that was in the meeting still alive today. Uh, we Talk, I talked with them for a week and uh, tried to find out what was being said in this meeting. And we went to action places where people had to live um, and where the meeting took place. Uh, we tried to go to these places out on the ice. Uh, and we shot it for like uh, two days, but we were there for a week because we had a big blizzard, a three-day big blizzard, and when we shot it in like two days. Is it two days? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the lady. Yeah. The houses. Oh, what were the what were the houses in the settlement? Uh, 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 what, what what type of houses were they? What were they expected to to move into? When when, when I moved to Iglulik uh, myself, I bought an old abandoned house. It wasn't one of the original ones. It was, I think, a second generation house, maybe a house from the seventies. Uh, the original it was all prefab. They uh, government shipped up these slabs of walls and uh, they assembled these houses uh, kind of like shacks out of plywood and um, I guess gave people, put stoves in them and people had heated houses. Um, but uh, the wind would, in my house certainly came through the seams and I built another house inside the house to be able to be warm. Um, but, uh, you know, the, these, Iglulik was like what we think of as a refugee settlement now. Um, people were uh, displaced and installed somewhere um, where they didn't really have anything to do um, except exist. And um, that would be another film that we haven't made yet. Um, right there. Um, can you talk a bit about the significance of the, the you know, the trip to get the sugar and, and, and uh, you know, uh, very other types of food? Zach, or maybe? Uh, why, why uh, he, he really wanted to, like, they, they obviously went for, uh, they went to get sugar, and it was a very, uh, was, it, was it a totally significant thing, or was it just they, they needed the, that particular supply? Like, did it have any, you mean, or any greater significance than we were out of sugar? Right, so was there something specifically significant about him going to get sugar? Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, obviously there's uh, been other issues attached to sugar, right? Yeah, do you wanna, wh wh uh, wh why did Talk you pick him, sugar. why did you decide for that he would go and get sugar particularly or search for sugar particularly? Is 
Well, you see, <clears throat> it's in my time when I was a child. We were Eskimos, native people. We were white man. We were scared of white people. Anything is it got from the white man. It's a good thing, beautiful, like a goal we want. Because human never see things new for them. They will want it, whoever you are. When they're singing all the time, they're not interesting. So Eskimos were very interesting about the white man's stuff that time. That's why they want sugar and tobacco, even tobacco with that tobacco was it come from white people. The fact is it mostly come from Indian people. Because Eskimos and Indians never be together. They don't know each other. We were far in the north, hardly know about the world. And the world does not know much. What the one man come down there, sometime they have something that we don't know. We want it. That's why we want to sugar and tobacco, gum, anything that is from the white man. We want it. That's why we want sugar, tobacco, and happy about it. Thank you. Feel it. Yes, uh, it, it, it was like nicotine. Like it, sugar is like nicotine. Once you have it, you want. You always want it. Once you have tobacco, you want it. You always want it. It's a nicotine that was introduced in our area. And once you have it, you want want to have it. Uh, okay, well, go ahead. I'm afraid this will have to be the last one. So go ahead. Uh, do you feel that understanding between the two the, uh, different cultures, uh, southern culture and northern culture, is, is better now than it was 50 years ago? Yeah. yeah. Of course, we're, we're working together. <laughs> <laughs> we're always working together. Me, okay. Um, I feel sorry that I hardly hear anything because I knew, I'm a new generation man. I grew up with a rifle and skidoo, shooting animals for a living. Also, riding a skidoo all the time. My ear damaged. I hardly hear anything. I hardly understand anything. Anyone who speaks, sorry about that. But I'm very much happy before you people because in my time, I was scared of white people. We never say white man. And so I'm right here before you and talking to you. I feel confident about it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thanks for the questions. Thanks for the film. Congratulations. <laughs>